I want to introduce our, I want to introduce Matt to Campbell. Uh, Matt was born and raised near Seattle. He started his career as a TV news reporter, which eventually took him to Little Rock, Arkansas. Expecting to stay there two years, he's now been in an Arkansas for 19 years, spending most of that as the spokesman for former Governor and Attorney General Mike Beebe. Since his stage four diagnosis in May of 2016, he's been receiving care at UAMS, Rockefeller Cancer Institute, which is conveniently located seven blocks from his house. So we want to welcome Matt. For the record, the word is Arkansan. Uh, I have learned over time. That's what, oh no, that's all right. That's what we call ourselves down there. So uh, my name is Matt DeCampel. The last name is very unique. Uh, so my friends call me Matty D. Uh, my enemies live inside of me and that's why we're all here today. Uh, as you heard in the introduction, I was raised, uh, born and raised in Renton, Washington, just outside of Seattle. Went to college at Washington State University and decided I wanted to be in television. And so uh, after three years working in Tri-Cities, Washington, I got a job in Little Rock and went down there for about three years. Uh, expecting to be there for two, went down there for about three and then got uh, recruited over to work in the world of government. We had a newly elected attorney general who needed a spokesman. And so I went to work for him and then he went on to become a very successful and very popular two-term governor, and his name was Mike Beebe. And so after all of that, uh, I decided to go into business on my own, and all my contacts were in Arkansas at that point, or at least my best professional contacts, so I stayed there. And that's what I was doing in the spring of 2016 when I started having uh, dizzy spells while I was working out at the gym. And so I would cut those, cut those short, and uh, didn't think about it too much. And I started gaining a lot of weight. And I said, well, that's what happens, I guess. Uh, you know, metabolism's given out. Uh, I'm in my 40s now. And uh, so I'm not working out as much. I'm gaining weight. But it got really uncomfortable. So I went to see my GI doc because I felt that uh, I may have had like a bacterial gut infection or something like that. Uh, blood test showed nothing. And so she said, just to be safe, I'm sure you, a lot of the patients in here have heard this before. Just to be safe, let's do an abdominal ultrasound. And that's when they found spots in a lot of places. Uh, liver, pancreas, abdomen, some other things. And so my doctor, Dr. Angela Newt, is the one who made the call and said, I hope you're sitting down. And uh, told me she was pretty sure that I had a pretty severe form of cancer. I went to University of Arkansas for medical sciences, uh, like, uh, like Stacy said, seven blocks from home, so that was very convenient. And I uh, had my, my first screenings at Rockefeller Cancer Institute, and sure enough, uh, they told me almost immediately I had a highly aggressive stage four intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. And I had had it for about six months which means I had not only fooled a blood test the week before, I had fooled a blood test a few months before with my GP, and my liver uh, on its own is such a champ that as these three tumors grew inside it, it pretty much worked around them, like uh, traffic around a construction zone. So my liver functions were fine, but the, uh, obviously, overall, my liver was not. So we went directly into very aggressive treatment because it was a very aggressive disease at that point, uh, gems arsisplatin at first. And while we started that, we planned a radiation and ended up uh, doing the Y90, uh, the yttrium 90 microbead uh, treatment directly into the tumors in my, in my liver. And it was fantastic. Um, the tumor shrunk. And uh, initially, there were just three tumors in my liver, even though the ultrasound had spots in a lot of other places. And so just plowed along, um, got through the 16 cycles of uh, Gemsys and decided to uh, talk with my oncologist, a fantastic uh, bulldog of a woman named Dr. Lumilda, uh, Lumilda Schaefer in Little Rock and uh, decided to take a break for six weeks or so. 
And after six weeks, we came back and took the CT scan, and nothing was happening. And another six weeks, and it ended up being about seven months, uh, to the point where when I passed the six-month mark with no activity with the tumors, uh, I was technically in remission, which was crazy to me. Uh, just over one year after being diagnosed with a disease for which I never got a specific prognosis and never got too much uh, onto Google, but a lot of you know, people did. And uh, you got the feeling that this was not a disease that uh, people had very good odds at getting very far with. And so came back, even though I had hit the limit for uh, gemsarsis platin, I'd handled it well enough that we decided to keep going, did four more cycles of that, and then the CT scan showed that that had stopped working. So we switched over from there to Fulfiri, the fantastically named FU5. And uh, I got to start carrying around uh, my little chemo grenade, as I called it, for the 48 hour, 46 hour infusions. And uh, that went well, and we did 18 uh, rounds of that. Uh, but during that time as well, there were new small lesions that had started to show up throughout my abdominal cavity, some of them attached to peritoneal areas, some of them to lymph nodes. And uh, again, the acetes fluid just kept building and growing from time to time, and so I'd have it drained. Not as often as I may have liked for vanity purposes, but uh, you try arguing with an oncologist. It uh, does not go very well for you, usually. And, uh, and then I got done with that this past summer. I was given a break again, about six to eight week break. And uh, that got to do a lot of fun stuff with that. Came back, started back on full theory. And then in November, I had a very acute nausea. And I actually didn't have a lot of nausea with the treatment. So uh, they admitted me for a few days to the hospital and took some scans. And the CT showed that the full theory now had stopped working. At that point, we decided again, because we had looked for clinical trials before from time to time and during my breaks especially, and hadn't found anything that had fit. Um, I'm IDH2, which is a, a lesser, more rare of the, of the mutations. And in fact, not long after I was diagnosed, they did a biopsy and we sent it off to Foundation Medicine to get, uh, to get the genetic profile on it, hoping to find a lot of other cases that I could network with. And they found five. Uh, that it ever had my specific profile for a tumor. And uh, my oncologist contacted all five of those institutions where they'd been treated, and no one called her back, which, of course, led us to believe that the cases were no longer active. But immediately after that, I started referring to my disease as my hipster cancer because it was, uh, I was really into it, but it was very rare and very underground, and you probably have never heard of it. And uh, that turned out to be true for a lot of people that I know, um, and for me myself at the time. This time, uh, in November, we started looking around for clinical trials and found a couple at a couple places to look and got a call back from NIH. And uh, they, they had a trial that they thought I would qualify for. They had reviewed all of my records. And so I had a schedule to go up there and meet and get screened further and hopefully start a trial. The first one, that I tried to get into. My hemoglobin levels dropped to the point where I no longer could qualify for it. Uh, so I lost that one after all the anticipation and build up with that. After that, uh, there was a oral chemo trial that had just started. I would have been the third person on this trial on this drug ever. And that one looked really good. And the oncologist I had met at NIH, Dr. Mitra, was uh, very excited about it for me and said, we're going to try to get you into this right away and get you back here next week and starting on treatment. At this point, it had been about two months without treatment with an active disease, which, of course, is never ideal. And uh, he called me two days later. I could tell immediately he was not happy. And he said that the slot in the trial had been taken while we were meeting about the trial. So I lost that one. And I was still crestfallen. And uh, yeah, it was, it was heartbreaking. But then he got back to me again because now he was an advocate for me because you know he, he, uh, he had met me and, and thought he had me all set up. We found a third trial and that one worked. And last week uh, I started my clinical trial at NIH. It's a new drug called TD-CID. It is a reactivation drug, 
which means that essentially it goes in and reminds the cells that they actually know how to fight cancer. Uh, but when cancer attacks the cells, it kind of covers up that part of their, uh, their guidebook as to how to be a cell. And so this drug, they think, essentially goes in and is like, you know, hey, idiot, look at chapter 12. You know how to fight this. And it has shown good results in others so far. I'm one week in. I was in Bethesda yesterday for my checkup and took my, uh, took my dose of chemo this morning before I came down here. So I'm, I'm very much in the middle of it, and we'll see where it goes from there. So what have I learned from all of this experience? Because it has been quite an experience. Um, I learned that a lot of times cancer is just as much about other people around you as it is about you. I had a lot of people, of course, who were very concerned from the outset. I have a great uh, support system uh, in Little Rock. I've got a brother from another mother that takes me to every chemo treatment, has sat there in all the infusion labs with me. Uh, my parents are still on the West Coast in the house I grew up in. They come and visit every few months. My sister and my niece are on the East Coast, and they sent me the fantastic socks that I am wearing today that I will show you later if you ask nicely. Um, but I had a lot of friends, uh, of course, or even professional acquaintances in Arkansas who wanted to know what was going on. And you find out you can only go through your story, especially at the outset, so many times uh, without it kind of really draining on you in addition to everything else. So I started, uh, I posted a, a blog post. I'd never blogged before. I've been a writer my whole life, but, uh, or at least my whole professional career. And I decided, well, let's just put it out there and it'll solve a lot of problems, give people a lot of information, and everyone wants to help, uh, which of course is tough to do with a disease that you don't really know much about. And uh, living in the South, usually the primary way of helping is through casseroles. And I knew early on that if I accepted those, obviously I wasn't eating very much at the time, uh, I'd be running a food pantry out of my house within about a week. And so I made that part of uh, the announcement and, uh, and just kind of talked about, walked people through what it was, what I was going to start to do. And of course, everyone says, anything I can do, let me know. And I said, if I can figure anything out, I will let you know. And then I started updating the blog uh, pretty regularly. And it was therapeutic for me because uh, I am a writer and it was good to kind of get stuff down and be able to, to look at it and to form it. And uh, then I started adding music to the blog. And people really liked that. And some confessed to me to this day that when I make a new blog post, they go and listen to the music first and then go back and read about how I'm doing. And I don't even take that too personally. Uh, but it became a very well-read uh, well blog. And it's the reason I'm here today, because Mary Ott uh, found it. And I had not heard about the foundation. And so she... Uh, kind of got me in touch with everyone and got me on the list, and here I am uh, as a speaker. I I've also learned comedy has always been an important part of my life, uh, and not any more so than in the past two and a half years. I do improvised comedy uh, on stage, which is the type of comedy that you make up as you go along, like whose lines it anyway. It's not stand-up. There's no prep ahead of time. And uh, actually did it once while on my full theory drip. So I did on stage comedy while receiving chemo. And of course we found no other instance of that ever happening. Uh, that was a little crazy and we worked it in where we could uh, in, into everything. But whatever happens and however good or terrible I feel, I try not to miss that weekly opportunity to be on stage, to be with some of my closest friends and to laugh and just as importantly, to make other people laugh. And I encourage people to laugh about my cancer. Um, and it petrifies a lot of people, you know, and I'll make jokes about it that I won't repeat here. And, uh, and they say, oh my gosh, how can you say that? I'm like, it's my cancer. I will say what I want to about it. And I will call it whatever names uh, that I wish. And, and, and that just really helps carry me along through a lot of this. I, I also really value those times of normalcy. Those times when you forget, you don't forget that you have cancer, but you get to kind of live the life that you had before cancer. And I travel when I can. And this summer, I was traveling around the Northeast some, and I went to a baseball game in Cleveland. 
and I was by myself, just sitting in this crowd. I got a ticket late, and I had fans of the Indians on one side of me, fans of the Yankees on the other side of me, and everyone's giving each other good-natured guff and everything, and I'm talking with everyone, and we're all joking. No one there knows I have cancer, and no one would even suspect it, because outside of being a little heavy at the time, uh, I looked like I always do. And those are the great days for me. Um, my friends, of course, treat me as normal as possible, but it's always in the back of their head, and understandably so, because they care. That uh, they, they are keeping a closer eye on me because they don't know exactly what's gonna, what could happen or is going to happen at any given minute. Plus, a lot of them knew what the odds were early on of me still being here. But I'm playing with house money now, so I just, uh, I, uh, I keep trucking along. Uh, after, ever since my nausea in, uh, in November, I've lost a lot of weight because the uh, tumor fluid, clever as it is, has gone from accumulating in my abdomen to now being smaller but lining up along my organs and my GI tract. And it makes it difficult to keep food down. Uh, I have to be very careful about sugar at all right now which sucks because Stacy made cookies. And uh, there's been a lot of sweet things all over the place that I've seen so far. But it's, uh, you know, it's a new challenge. I've, I've had an amazing team of doctors. Uh, Dr. Chen, who's running, my, who's running my clinical trial, my interventional radiologist, Dr. Meek. Uh, I've, I've had a procto-oncologist that I didn't even know was a thing until I needed one and was very glad to. And uh, next week, I get to meet a proctourologist. And the vast majority of those, except for NIH, are at the Rockefeller Cancer Institute at UAMS, which is a fantastic facility. And they've taken great care of me. And I've made a lot of friends there and uh, almost family, of course, with these nurses and doctors that you spend a lot of time with, especially when you're getting infused. And you also meet a lot of people that remind you that no matter what you're going through, someone's going through something worse. Someone has uh, a different history and life experience than you do. And it really does broaden your mind more and you never stop learning in life. And even though it's been a darker side of life, learned a lot about being human and uh, about a lot of people. And so, of course, it's great to come to a conference like this and meet a lot of you who have gone through similar, more direct experiences and I, that I don't have to spell cholangiocarcinoma for. And, uh, you know, we all just uh, keep fighting every day. And I find, you know, a lot of people call you brave if you have cancer and you're fighting cancer. And I, I have trouble with that word because I, I'm not approaching it as a form of bravery. I want to stick around. <laughs> you know, I like being here. Um, it's very self-driven. It's, it's, uh, it's very self-centered. I mean, I, I want to stay around and uh, whatever help I get is, is, is great, but that's what we're all fighting for is another day, another month, another year, uh, another milestone, another trip. My impulse control has been damaged greatly by cholangiocarcinoma, especially when not with online shopping. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, we all just continue going through this together. So I, I thank you all for being here and, uh, and, and listening to me and I, I will take some questions if I have any time left. I don't know how long I've been rambling. I was going to run my stopwatch, and then it didn't. But if anyone's got any questions, or you can just find me uh, later on, and we'll chat. It's still early on in the session. Not a lot of people want to get up and ask questions, I understand. But uh, thank you for having me, and I uh, look forward to seeing what else the next few days bring. Thank you.